I'd like to welcome you to the conversation shop. Today we have our very special guest, Mr. Jamal Eubanks. How are you doing today, Jamal? Good, man, good. Yeah, I want to welcome you to the show. I'm very happy to have you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. I'm looking forward to this opportunity. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, today I'm very interested in uh, the workshop, the active, interactive workshop that you have called Fuel or Crutch. Uh, but before we get into that, you know, I want you to introduce yourself to my guest and just tell us a little bit about you. You know, you're an entrepreneur, you're an educator, you're a public speaker, you're a motivator. You're just someone, a young man in the community that I, I really respect. So uh, let's start by uh, telling my audience a little bit about you and, and who you are. So uh, born and raised in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, was the first, actually the first graduate from James C. Wright Middle School uh, when they built it. I was actually there and helped break ground and dig the dirt. Oh, wow. um, so, you know, that's uh, one of those historical uh, memories that I have. Um, graduated from West in 2002. Okay. Um, wasn't easy. <laughs> Coming from a single parent home, just me, mom, brother, and grandmother for all uh, purposes. Um, got the opportunity to go off to college. I did not want to stay in college and go to college here. Mm -hmm. So I uh, ventured down to Alabama, went to school at uh, Alabama State, which is a historically black college university. Okay, um, okay, okay, okay. I know about that. You don't know that, do you? No, nah, I did not. I, no, I know about Southern. That's you, baby. Oh, okay, yeah. My Why uncle went to it? Southern too for a little bit. Okay. Um, but then after two years of being at the HBCU, I loved it. I had a great time ball there. Um, Love the atmosphere, love the, the just the exposure to a different um, community feel, just because being mm -hmm. born and raised in Madison, got a, a mixed bag. Um, mm -hmm. But there in Alabama State, it was um, pretty much all black. So it was kind of, you know, a different culture. Um, mm -hmm. Had to adjust and get used to, but loved it. Um, but, you know, something was missing. You know, I grew up playing sports all my life. So mm -hmm. after uh, two years being there, I, um, I transferred. I transferred to a small school called Huntington College, but it was right there in Montgomery. It was literally probably a mile, mile and a half away tops. Okay, okay. Um, I got a chance to go there and play basketball, so I got the chance to okay. live out, out, out a dream. Okay. Um, and then kind of from there, uh, life is taking its own turn. Um, yes, as life does. Right. And so in 2008, when I graduated, I moved back to Madison, mm -hmm. um, started working in education and uh, raising a family, have two girls. Okay. Um, got a, a little guy too. He seventeen, be eighteen in July. Okay. Uh, you okay. Know, not a little guy. <laughs> right. Not a little guy anymore. He big guy. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but you know, just uh, got back and started working in education. Okay. Um, working uh, started off as a. EA special ed assistant in the school Madison School District, mm -hmm. um, but wasn't necessarily fulfilled, wasn't doing what exactly what it was that I wanted to do. Okay. I wanted to be a, a, a teacher. Okay. I wanted to be a full-fledged teacher. That was a dream of mine um, as well, uh, going back to elementary school. Okay. I had one um, one black teacher, K through 12. Um, oh, wow. One, yeah. And uh, he was somebody that, you know, I still keep in contact with. Um, uh, I'm feeling extremely blessed and lucky that my, my oldest daughter has him right now. Mm -hmm. um, and he just had conversations with me on a consistent basis and brought things into perspective from uh, a different level. Just, you know, he didn't talk to me as a nine, 10 year old. He pulled me to the side and had conversations with me and somebody else 17 getting ready to go off to college and explore the real world, you know, and trying to let me know beforehand, like, you know, certain things are going to be expected of you and certain uh, stereotypes are going to be placed on you. But that's shocking to me what you said to me. We'll talk about that a little later, but <laughs> I'm just amazed that your entire time going K through 12 here, that yeah. you only had one African American, one person of color teaching you? Yeah, just one. Um, but, you know, because of that, I wanted to make sure that I had an opportunity to give back and give students that opportunity to have one that was as impactful um, on their life as it was for me. Okay. 
Okay. Um, you know, I'm a firm believer that uh, kids are going to mimic what they see. And so if they're not exposed to anything or anything of value that they can see in themselves, mm -hmm. they're not going to strive for it. Okay, okay. So is that kind of what, what led you to um, your mantra, your fuel or crutch? That's kind of what led me to, you know, creating a mentoring program, which I created, mm -hmm. which is Pivotal Transition. That's a mentoring program me and a buddy of mine mm -hmm. um, started, and, you know, we... Uh, mentor kids individually, but then we do have a cohort. Um, right now we have a cohort of about 12 to 15 uh, young ladies, um, majority of them in the fifth grade, mm -hmm. um, and we just work to get them to look beyond tomorrow, which is the motto, um, mm -hmm. because, you know, I think too, too much, too often that our kids are kind of stuck in today right. and tomorrow, okay. um, but not necessarily looking into the future. Okay. Um, and if you stuck looking today and tomorrow, you'll make some choices and make some bad decisions that'll affect your future. Um, and let, so, let me ask you a quick question, real quick. You know, your mentoring program. Tell me, uh, or tell my audience and myself. You know, what makes your program very different from the other mentoring programs that are out there that you know you may have experienced in the past? You know, tell me what separates your program from everything else. What are you doing a little bit differently? Um, we're getting them in and getting them together to kind of uh, teach them leadership skills and to also be peer support. Um, I feel that you can be have a lot of positive uh, peer pressure as well as negative, and mm -hmm. so we're promoting the positive side. Um, mm -hmm. You know, for example, I talked to them recently about um, if you guys are in a class together and you see one of your friends starting to act up, mm -hmm. um, do you laugh to egg it on and? And kind of make fun, um, or do you, you know, check them and hold them accountable? Like, hey, man, come on, you know better than that. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, you know, whether it be, hey, we play sports together, and we gonna need you this weekend because when you get sent home and get suspended, your parents not gonna let you play. Mm -hmm. um, so there, you know, there's a number of reasons to just hold, you know, your peers accountable and trying to make sure that um, you guys are on the right path and and supporting each other. Okay, okay, because it sounds like you're promoting you know, uh, good choices. Yes. Uh, teaching them how to make good decisions. Um, also, I'm assuming that, you know, uh, conflict resolution is a part of yeah, maybe definitely. what you guys are doing. We you do know. conflict resolution. We do self-advocacy skills. We teach, um, like I said, leadership skills. We work on um, literacy skills, too, because we know how important reading is. Yes. Um, and, and we get a lot of different speakers to come in um, to the kids and just talk with them about the different things that they're doing, whether it be career or education, okay. just to get their minds to expand and see, you know, other things that are out there that they may not have thought about. Okay. We had a young lady come in that is amazing with the violin and okay. came in and just killed it. And you know, the girls was like, "Oh my God, that that's amazing!" Because they're at the age where they're starting out playing the the, the instruments. Mm -hmm. um, we had uh, Bobby Kelsey come and, oh, and speak nice. to the girls, you know, because they're all a lot of them are into basketball, mm -hmm. and they uh, got a chance to talk to her. Um, and you know, we had um, someone come in from a bank, um, the branch manager of a bank, to come in and speak to him about financial literacy. Okay. And, you know, kids are super high on uh, slime right now, so right. <laughs> she taught them how to turn that into a business uh, okay. adventure and how to come up with a plan and, and things of that nature. And so they were all excited. They've been engaged in... It's, it's very interesting. Entrepreneurism. Yep. That's what yes. I want to, um, you know, promote to them as well. It's like, you know, there's a lot of ways that you can uh, make money. There's a lot of things that you can do um, that's positive. Okay. You know. Well, tell me a little bit more of some of the other things that you're doing as well. I didn't mean to take you out task. Oh, no, no, no. Yes. About the mentorship, but it sounded like you were doing something... Uh, a little bit different from what was normally available. Out there. Yeah, I mean, I feel like a lot of times, you know, you, when you have mentoring and stuff, you know, you meet with somebody one on one. Um, but I felt like, you know, some sort of group, um, especially with them all being the same age and in the schools together, mm -hmm. um, you know, learning how to hold each other accountable and accepting it. Okay. Because uh, a lot of times you might tell somebody, "Hey, man, you need to calm down," but then they go off on you because you you ain't my daddy, you ain't not my mama, you right. know, type thing. So. You know, as long as they're learning how to accept that um, piece where they're being held accountable by their peers okay. in an appropriate manner. Well, prior to us going into our break, I want to make sure we don't end this, in, end this segment without you telling me 
and telling my audience specifically about Fuel Crutch. Oh, so I started uh, Eubank Solutions, um, and under that umbrella is Fuel a Crutch. It's a, um, kind of an interactive uh, speaking engagement that I created, um, but the, 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 the phrase Fuel a Crutch literally just came to me one night as I was sitting kind of stuck um, in neutral, not necessarily figuring out things to go forward or mm -hmm. backwards, and I just was stuck and I couldn't understand why. But I had to stop and think about it once the message came to me and found the meaning behind the message. Mm -hmm. So fuel or crutch literally to me um, means, you know, we all deal with adversity. We all deal with hardships. Mm -hmm. um, and it's all inclusive. Uh, hardships and adversity doesn't discriminate on anybody. Right. <laughs> no age. Exactly. No age, no race, no religion. Everybody experiences it. Mm -hmm. um, and from, from that, I feel there's two types of people either the ones that are going to use those hardships and adverse times as fuel mm -hmm. to motivate themselves to work harder, to better the situation, better relationships, or just better overall outcome. Or you're going to have the flip side where people make a million excuses that serve as crutches for why they can't move forward, why they can't right. do anything, and not accept accountability. Because at the end of the day, I feel like it's your choice on how you internalize those situations. Mm -hmm. For me, for example, you know, a father not being in the picture uh, for... 99% of my life. Mm -hmm. um, I know who he is, but I don't really know him. Right. Um, I use that as fuel to motivate me to make sure that my kids wouldn't have to go through that. Right. I'm there for graduations. I'm there for award ceremonies. I'm there for sporting events. You know, whatever I can make it there for, I'm there for. Mm -hmm. um, but I know a lot of guys who claim they didn't have their father in their life, and so they use that as an excuse and a crutch for why they're not in their own kids' lives. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, same same situation, two different choices on how they want to do, handle it. Gotcha. I like that. Well, after we go into our break, um, I look forward to uh, finishing that conversation. Well, guys, we'll be right back after this break with The Conversation Shop. Hi, welcome back to The Conversation Shop. Uh, we're back with my very special guest, Mr. Jamal Eubanks. Uh, Jamal and I uh, earlier were discussing um, who he was, his programs that he's a part of, your mentorship program, which is? Pivotal Transition. Pivotal Transition and also Fuel or Crutch, which is what I'm really, really interested in, just different aspects of that. But prior to going into the program, I want to pick your brain a little bit. I want to talk about, kind of separate, you know, the fuel and the crutch, because it sounds like Fuel or Crutch, you know, is based in and teaching uh, conflict resolution, and, but also teaching, teaching kids and adults mm -hmm. how to make good choices, right. how to use negative circumstance as fuel to push forward, but right. how do you convert that energy, right? So what I'm curious about, since you're very active in the schools and you're talking to the kids, you know, um, there was a um, statistic that um, was shared with, with me previously that surprised me <laughs> yeah and and would you share that statistic with so me? uh some of the the madison schools i would probably say that i know for sure a couple of the madison high schools um their african-american freshmen are um, are averaging two or more f's and the alarming number is it's anywhere between 49 and 65 percent that's blows my mind you know it just it really blows my mind and it makes me want to ask a couple of questions, you know. Um, and we're gonna get into the fuel of crush thing real quick. You know, the first question which everybody goes into, well, what are the schools doing? What's the school's responsibility? So, you know what I'm saying? The schools it's their fault, right? Mm -hmm. So let's 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 talk about the school's fault for a second, okay? A little bit. You're in the schools, you have a different perspective. Maybe you don't think it's the school's fault. But what I'll say is, from my perspective, you know, uh, when I speak to young kids, uh, and I'm around kids that are have the privilege of being at schools that break from what the standard uh, curriculum is, uh, the core curriculum for another terminology, or the curriculum that the teachers are made uh, to teach. Right. Um, it's the curriculum that most of the students of color have a problem with. Mm -hmm. So that's the first issue that you hear about the schools. We're not being represented because the things that I hear are, are that what's being taught in schools are 
for them or, or kids of color are not things that build their self-esteem. Right. They're, not, they're not things that tell them they can go out into the world and accomplish anything that they, they want. What they're hearing uh, in these schools that are sticking to this core standard or whatever you want to call a curriculum in teaching tells them that they're crooks, reinforces that they're criminals, and tell them that they're not going to be successful. You know, that's, those are the things that, that I'm kind of hearing on that side. And then on the good side, I'm seeing that or hearing that the schools that are really successful are the schools that's breaking from that standard curriculum or teachers that are innovative. They're interjecting different readings or different things into their curriculum to make sure that it's more representative of the student population at the schools to push the schools forward in a very positive way. So since you're, uh, you have experience here in the Madison schools, my question to you is, are you seeing anything similar to that? Or share with me some of the things you're hearing. Um, I mean, there are um, a lot of good that does go on in the schools, and there are some teachers that differentiate really well. Um, but, you know, of course, just like with every uh, coin, there's two sides to it. Mm -hmm. um, and there are some that don't differentiate, that don't um, uh, make the, the, the assignments a little more uh, culturally responsive. Mm -hmm. um, and talk about that a little bit when you say culturally responsive for those of us that don't know what that means. Uh, just making it representative of, you know, the student um, and the student population. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've, we've been in the schools for so long where um, I don't even believe that black history is really uh, pushed anymore. Mm -hmm. um, you might walk into a building and see kind of like a bulletin board with Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, and that might be about it. Um, really? And so, you know, I think a lot of the students aren't necessarily being taught um, that we have a whole lot more um, to offer or that we've given to this country uh, from a historical standpoint, you know, to, uh, to, for some pride. Just as I think the students need to be more prideful of themselves, but based on what the media portrays right now and, and what they teach. Uh, in the school, um, you know, with Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, and then slavery. Let's talk about, but real quickly, let's talk about environment for a second. You just threw me a little bit, okay? So you mean to tell me that we're, it's 2018, and we're in Madison, the progressive city, right? Right. So I can come into a school and walk around the schools in Madison now that have diverse populations, mm -hmm. and I don't see pictures or representations of that diverse population around the school. Not all of them, but you can definitely go into some of the schools and, and see um, a lot of well, lack of imagery on, on there, on, me, in the buildings. And let me ask you another question. Another question, you alluded to this to me earlier when you said when you went to school here in Madison that, because to me that's an issue, mm -hmm. that you only had one a teacher of color that right. taught you. All mine were, mm -hmm. through K through 12, all of them. Okay, so... You're sharing with me a different, now my eyes are opening up to my, what some of the differences are with my perspective than yours, right. with my education and the things that I was taught. So my question to you now is, how much has that changed? So these kids are going into these schools, mm -hmm. these minority kids, and not just talking about African American kids, Hispanic kids, kids of color, right, mm -hmm. are going into these Madison schools. Are the teachers that are teaching them reflective of, of are the, they seeing images of themselves? No, not Or is close. it still similar it's to still, when you went to school? It's still very similar, um, and it's unfortunate. Um, and I know a lot of times I get asked why there aren't more um, teachers of color in, in Madison. Um, it's hard to recruit uh, teachers of color when you don't have many to go out and, and try and bring in. Um, I've heard that before. Let me ask you a question. I've heard the recruit thing. You got a population in a community of, 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 uh, of brown people, African American people, people of color through this entire community. It's an educated community. A lot of us are pushed to go to the schools, go to University W. Madison. You mean to tell me there aren't programs or quote unquote pathways oh, they have that a can be created to push teachers into the university to keep those teachers here? They do. Um, like they have a build your own program in Madison. Okay. Um, but again, it's kind of hard to grow up with the vision of this is what I want to be and want to do when you grow up not seeing, seeing it. it. 
Right. I just, I, I, I trust me. Now you're opening my eyes to Madison. Okay. You, you really are. So to me, then we, we shouldn't be surprised or the Madison school district shouldn't be surprised at our, uh, at the, the challenges that students of color are facing because it's that you, 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 you think self-esteem issues on one hand, you know, you're telling one segment of your student population that they can go out and excel and be whatever they want to be. The world is their pearl. And then on another hand, in schools, you're telling a large percent of your population, basically you're going to be subservient to, these, to this population. That's pretty much what you're telling them. Yep. And then you wonder when you get a fight, a pushback, right? And then on top of that, you, the schools are telling us, we're going to put, okay, yeah, we have you, so we're going to take, they'll say, well, we had someone that brought guns to school, right? Just mm -hmm. a gun in Madison school. No knock to the gun thing that happened in Florida. But let's say someone brought a gun to school or a knife to school. That's a big deal, right? Right. But they let two or three kids, right, make a decision for hundreds. So the rest of the, the kids didn't, who didn't bring the guns and knives to schools, who don't fight when they come to school, they have to pay for the three that the police or the schools could could make it a non-factor for them. There's ways to handle those three people to make it to make it safe for every one other students in the schools without putting police into the schools. So what happens when we have the police into the schools, right? So what, what do we see out in the population? Because the schools are reflective of the communities and the population that they're in, right? Mm -hmm. So you go in the population and you see the disparity between the arrest and the people in jails and prisons in Madison, right? People of color, right? It's right. reflective of that. So what's the argument? There's no argument because it's going to be reflective of the kids and the students in the schools that get sent back to those places. You know, and I, I get so amazed that no one is really in uproar about it because there's ways to make it work. I'm not saying that it's, an, it's a conversation that needs to be had, but the lens that from a person of color comes from is, are you going to be cycling my kids to this this, this complex prison system. You know, right now my child doesn't have a charge. Now that I have to worry about them getting a, a criminal charge when they're in high school, that's not going to happen. Not with my kids, not with my grandkids, not with anybody that I can put my hands on because I can tell you that's a space you don't know, you don't need to be in from my perspective. So those are the things that when I see talk about schools, schools seems, the schools, some of the schools that I've aware of here in Madison seem to as a culture be telling minority kids we don't want you you know and and, and that's what's amazing what's shocking to me in the school systems you'll give us all these programs right mm -hmm. but you let my child come here and lay under the table not participate in the class because he has a, a behavior problem knowing he's not learning nothing right and say that's okay because you want the money the school wants the money for him to be there even though you're not teaching him nothing, you're teaching him to be an idiot. You're teaching him not to want to go to school. You're teaching him that school has no value. So the community of the school is reinforcing that you're nothing. Because the kids, kids learn from what they see, right? right? So they see where all the efforts are going into, right? They see who, where all the praise is going to, right? They don't see it with them. They don't walk past teachers and see smiles on their face telling them they can be anything that they can be other than Mr. Eubanks, or someone else that they're interacting with. But I'll, before we go into the next segment, um, won't you, uh, I'll let you comment on that real quick. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of <laughs> implicit uh, bias in the, in the schools in general, um, you know, based on what, what uh, stereotype or thought process they've had, whether it be coming from the media or whether it be some students that they've had before, they come in with kind of like this preconceived notion that all the students are going to act a certain kind of way. Um, I was a kid that never got suspended K through 12, but I do remember coming into a classroom and feeling unwelcomed and unwanted in the classroom. Mm -hmm. You know, and sometimes, you know, whether it was the best decision or not, if I felt like the teacher didn't like me for a reason that I didn't give them. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know why, but you know, I kind of felt like I was going to take it upon myself to give them a reason not to like me. Mm -hmm. I understand. I understand. Hold that thought because we're going to finish with the schools and then we're going to move right into the responsibility of the students and the parents. We'll be right back 
on the conversation shop. Hi, welcome back to the conversation shop. Uh, we're here with Mr. Jamal Eubanks uh, with Fuel of Crutch. Uh, Jamal, uh, let's dive right back into the conversation we were having. Um, you know, we were talking about the environment that the students are in um, that tells students of color that they are not welcome. And you were telling me that when you were in school here in Madison that you've gone into classrooms and felt unwelcome for no other reason other than you look like someone else that they may have had the year before that was bad. Right. That they deemed I mean, was a bad student. Could be any reason why, but you know, sometimes you just don't feel comfortable walking into a certain classroom, even if it was, you know, having a class on your schedule and you walk into the classroom and the teacher asks you, Are you sure you're supposed to be in this classroom? Um, you know, things situations like that, you know, make you not feel like you're supposed to be there. If you were already feeling uneasy, like you're going into an algebra two trig class mm -hmm. and the teacher is like, um, let me see your schedule because I don't know if you're supposed to be in here. Right, it makes it, I, I see the undertones right. that are going on in the schools, and that's what I mean when I talk about the culture of the schools telling students of color that they're not welcome and that they're not going to be successful. So the, 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 the community here, the community of the schools to me, are creating situations to validate, I call it the self-fulfilling prophecy, right? It's the things that have been done to people of color and, poor people throughout history, right? So there's a situation that's, that gets created, right? Mm -hmm. So you're navigating this situation. You may be responding to it in a negative, negative way. You're asking for help out of that situation. But the people that are offering a hand to you to give you help, they're vested in keeping you perpetuating the negative situation. Right. For money, for whatever reason, for validation that you can achieve, right? So when they don't give you access, to the classrooms, access to the education, because we're talking about access now. That's all we're talking about. Schools access to education, so they'll tell you, as the other man, right? I'm turning into the other man now. Well, you guys can walk into the schools and you have access to the same education that my daughter has access to. All you have to do is go to class and act right. Go to class on time, mm -hmm. be vested in the classroom. We all have problems. My wife died when my daughter was, was born. She doesn't have a mom. I'm a factory worker. I don't make a lot of money. I can't go out and get the Jordans that I see your kids wear every day. Right. I see them with Gucci on. I can't do none of that. But the only thing I can do is tell my daughter to get good grades. Mm -hmm. And she goes to class and she gets good grades and she works hard. Why can't your kids do that? You know, what's your response to that? You know, what's your response when this is, you know, from the outside looking in? Well, this is actually really one of the reasons why I kind of uh, created the, the Fuel of Crutch. Mm -hmm. It was like, you know, take a step back and understand your circumstance situation. Um, and just because you're in a certain situation or a circumstance doesn't mean you have to stay that way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's been people that have been homeless and graduate from high school, go off to college and do well. Mm -hmm. and, turn, and, you know, and turn their whole fortune around where now that they, they have a place to stay, now they have meals consistently, mm -hmm. and they don't want to go back to it, right. to not having. So, you know, they consistently work. Um, and that's why, you know, I feel like, you know, working, that, that work ethic, uh, learning how to, understanding, you know, your situation and wanting to change it uh, versus saying, you know what, it is what it is, and I'll just let it be and just, just leave it as is. Uh, I, I'm, I'm more of someone that wants to be results driven. Um, I like that. But so would you agree with that perspective? Because, you know, I'm giving you a, a, I hear this perspective a lot in the community from some of my, some, from some of my other friends. So I call it the other man perspective, right? Mm -hmm. But I'll give you the brother man perspective. The brother man perspective, which is another group of my friends, which is, you know, we're in schools that don't represent us, that tell us every time that we're not welcome, right? So, you know, you tell me about using fuel, mm -hmm. you know, to move forward. So I want to be successful. I want access to that education and, and to that information. So how can I get it without feeling demeaned? Without, how do I get it from the teachers without feeling like a puppy? Because I hear that from some of the, 
some of the uh, students of color as well, that when they go out and they're asking for extra, extra curricular work when they're trying to be engaged, uh, a lot of the times they're met with negativity. Right. They're not met with anything good. Right? Right. You know, you've shared with me some different things you've heard from students, and I want to share with the audience what you're hearing in real life from these um, kids. You know, it, it, then it, it, it stems into a lack of engagement. Um, you know, if you're not going to give me the help that I'm advocating for or the assistance that I'm advocating for, then why am I going to try? Why am I going to push for any more effort if you're not going to meet me halfway? Mm -hmm. um, and there's, you know, there are some teachers in the schools that are that way, but then there are some that will uh, go out of their way to try and help. Um, but yeah, I've, I've heard some crazy things just um, thinking on, on the topic of, you know, the whole idea of the educating process and mm -hmm. things that I've, that I've heard and, and going back to talking about the pride and, mm -hmm. and, and teaching us of our own uh, past. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the kids are, 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 are getting fluff. Um, and I got, I'm tired of the fluff, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, they didn't Rosa Parks and, and Martin Luther King kids to death. But the sad thing is, is I don't even believe that they've really gotten deep into any of those topics. Who they uh, are and what they did. What they really did and who they really are. Um, and like, and so I asked students like, hey, you know, so at least tell me who Malcolm X is. You know, go a little deeper. Who is Claudette Colvin? You know, yes. so give them some more context or dive a little deeper. Um, and the most alarming thing I ever heard was I had a student a couple years ago. Actually, it happened this, this year. Um, at, tell me that uh, they thought... Um, Malcolm X might have been a lawyer, and I said, why, why, did, why did you think that? And he told me it was because he saw a picture of him with a briefcase. Mm -hmm. um, and then even a couple years ago, I was working with some middle school kids, and you know, it was Black History Month, I'm like, hey, let's dive into, who do you, what do you guys know? And I don't want to hear the fluff, so no Rosa Parks, no Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. Tell me who you know, these different people are, and they didn't know. I was like, all right, well, give me the fluff that you do know. Mm -hmm. And I said, um, like, Martin Luther King, tell me about him. Uh, and the kid response, like, confident. Oh, he freed us. Oh, wow. And I, I had to pause. From what? <laughs> I, had, I had to pause and give him a, uh, give, give a second just to think, all right, maybe he could be thinking right. uh, freed us in a civil rights standpoint. And I was like, all right, uh, elaborate on that. And he said he freed us from slavery. Wow. And my mouth, my jaw instantly hit the floor, and I was just like, wow, we got a lot of work to do. Um, and but that's what I'm here for, and we're gonna dive into it. And that's what we did. We had um, a boys group after school, and we worked on you know just learning different aspects of their own history. Right. It just shocks me, but you know it takes me back to what I always say. I say you know um, whether you're sane or insane, right? So why would you? And I have to say this about the the school, the the curriculum, not the teachers, not the people, because we don't know individual intentions, right? Right, right, right. But we go at the, the, the culture of it, right? The systemat systematic, the system of it, right? So we as people of color keep looking to a system that has historically done what it's doing now. You're not represented in the classrooms, so you don't visualize that you can be a teacher. Right. You visualize that you can be what you want to think. The culture tells you, again, reiterating what we talked about earlier, that you're not going to be successful, or that some of you will be. Some of you are exceptions, right, to the rule. Those will be. You won't, right. And then every aspect of the school culture reinforces that they're nothing, and then we wonder why we had 49 percent non-graduation rate. We wonder why freshmen are, the majority of them. What do you say? 60. To, to anywhere between 49 and 65 percent are averaging two or more Fs. And, and you wonder why? That doesn't surprise me when. You know, it sounds like 95 plus percent of the teachers that they're going to are not reflective of who they are, reflective of the communities that they're even in. Right. Right. And then we have teachers that are coming from these communities that these kids aren't represented in, hoping that they can relate to these children and interact with them without looking at them with fear and looking at them like they're criminals or like they're up to something. Right. And then we keep looking to someone that's historically told us we were nothing, right? Mm -hmm. Didn't teach us right, right? Right. Historically it's done that, but we consistently keep looking to that system to educate us. That's insane to me. So my, my, that's insane 
to me. And it's insane to me, honestly, that I'm just going to put it bluntly that our community here in Madison, who I, I feel is majorly aware of this, isn't challenging the school system and challenging the status quo here to change that. Now, you say recruitment, right? Oh, mm -hmm. we, we, we can't recruit. You've, I've been, I graduated in 97. So from 97 to now, you mean to tell me that there couldn't have been pathways or things put in place <laughs> to get more African-American teachers here in, in, in Madison? Because I can tell you it was the same. We're having the same conversations that I heard when I was in school here. Right. I mean, it's shocking to me, okay? And that's when Madison and La Follette were in the top 30% of the schools in the country, right? Yeah. Now they're not. Why? Mm -hmm. Because the influx of the others, the people of color. As soon as there was an influx of people in color to the schools, then you had flight out of the schools to the suburbs. Yep. Right? So now Verona, I bet, is in the top 30, top what? <laughs> I, ain't no telling. I mean, yeah. top of the school, but you're not surprised by that, right? But they tell you it's because of them and all these other things, right? Right. So, again, we have to stop being insane, and we need to start looking in the mirror and figuring out how we can help ourselves and help push our kids forward. Because if our children don't know where they come from, I can't blame Miss Patty. I can't blame Principal Warren. I can't blame La Follette. I can't blame Wes. I can't. Because when the dust settles, it's my responsibility as a parent to prepare my child. To prepare my child. If, the school, if a bomb hit the schools tomorrow and I had to teach my kids and educate them, it's my responsibility. It's nobody else's. And we have to pass the buck. We'll be right back on the conversation shop. Welcome back to the conversation shop. And hey guys, we're just gonna dive right back into the conversation me and Jamal was having. You know, we we're talking about the school's responsibility in educating and educating uh, students of color. And we were kind of identifying, uh, focusing on fuel or crutch, but identifying the things that students of color can use for fuel. What are the things that, the barriers that they're having in schools, right? and in education and we zeroed in on that and, and we left off in the last segment with me saying and I'll repeat it again you know as people of color we keep looking to institutions systems that have historically um, and are designed to push us backwards they're not designed to you know we talk about fuel the crush building up self-esteem and you can do all these great things right right but the schools aren't doing that the schools aren't pushing self-esteem. On the outside exterior, they say they are, but even the great, the good schools, right? Right. So for everything good that you're saying in programs that you're doing, right? Mm -hmm. What are the kids seeing? For what they're seeing, when are they seeing? They may see one Jamal, but the rest of the two, the rest of the teachers don't look like them. Yeah, uh, I think nationally, what are we, two percent ish, roughly? Two mm -hmm. percent, as far as uh, African American teachers go, right. African American males, at, at least for sure. I think it's two percent, um, and so that, that's that's hard to to get a kid to envision himself becoming a teacher because clearly there's a whole lot of kids that aren't getting any. I was a kid that only had one. Mm -hmm. um, right now, my my daughter has one. Uh, my son had one. Um, my youngest daughter has the opportunity to have two. That's what, and see, that's I gotta, what I, I gotta see. challenge you on this because this is what I'll say, not challenge you, but the system, so to speak, right? Because I take that and I, you know, mind you, it's predominantly African American. I can go to Natchez, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. I can go to New Orleans, Louisiana. I can go to Vidalia, Louisiana. I can go to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, right? Different populations of people. You go into the schools, there are people of color in the schools because the community is vested in people that look like them being in the schools, working at the schools. The schools are providing opportunities where if it's not from a teaching standpoint, someone going in actually being a teacher, there's teacher's aides, there's liaisons, there's all these different things that are in place where there's interaction and students being able to see people that look like them in, 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 in positions of influence mm -hmm. and, 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 and that are teaching them and educating them and that are vested in them doing well, giving them the advice 
the African-American teacher gave you about life, pushing you forward, telling you you need to stop doing that. That's not going to get you anywhere. You're too smart for that. Stop hanging out with these knuckleheads. They know you're, you're better than that. Why don't you put your focus here? Just that little word, you know, someone looking out for you, someone saying, I see something in you that you don't see in yourself. Because yep. I had that. Someone had to tell me that, a teacher. Mm -hmm. I see something in you. you you're, you're smarter than you let on. Stop playing dumb. I had a teacher tell me that. Stop playing dumb. You're smarter than that. Hold yourself accountable. Right. You know, so those are the things that... that um, are missing. Are missing, you know. But again, from the schools, we're talking about self-esteem, right? So we're going to segue from that into the responsibilities of the students and the parents, but the culture. I want to leave my audience with, you know, we're talking about the culture of the schools, not just here in Madison to pick on Madison, but the culture in communities that don't have large uh, populations of people of color are often non-representative of those students in those schools and in those classrooms. And to think that it doesn't have a negative effect on those students is foolish. It's foolish. And to think that it doesn't influence the achievement gap is foolish. So again, to go back into, let's dive right into, you know, uh, our responsibility. So I'm about to turn into Brother Man. So Brother Man's out right now, right? Brother Man's out. So what's our responsibility? I can tell you, you know, from my perspective, is it our responsibility? You know, it's my responsibility to get my kid out the door in the morning and to get him to school. It's the school's responsibility to teach him, get him lunch and feed him. And it's my responsibility to take care of when they get back home. Other than that, that's my responsibility. That's the brother man. I've heard that. Right. But some the, I don't agree with that for the record. Uh, okay. Because I was going to say, at the same time, you know, uh, us as parents are our kids' first teacher, period. Let's talk about this from a child's standpoint. And you work, you're working with the kids, right? Right. So what's the child's responsibility outside of their circumstance? Right. I feel, I mean, once the student gets there, um, you know, as much as hard as it is, um, you've got to you know try and, and and refocus. You know, put your mind where you're at. You know, you're there for a reason, and you're going to be there for the next seven, eight hours. So my thing is, get something out of it while you're there. Don't come there and be there all day, and don't learn nothing. Mm -hmm. Like I, even at the high school level, I, I have a hard time understanding why a kid comes to school and don't go to the classroom, don't go in the class. Like, you just came here all day to skip. They don't value the education. Right. And they don't value it. I'm gonna, I got to comment on it. But, right I mean, because the kids also have, the student. I mean, the teachers need to try and engage them and trying to get the kids there. But once you get them there, hold their attention. But at the same time, the kids need to follow the directions and, and sit and, you know, like they're supposed to, like a, like a student. You're supposed to be there to take notes, to, to gain the information that the teachers are trying to give to help you and your knowledge for advancement. You got to value it though. You got right. to you got to value gotta see what the you're value getting. of education. You got to see that value and and you know, I'm just amazed that our kids are just I don't, where's the disconnect coming from? Where's the the devaluing of education? You know, in our households. And that's the question that I have is, you know, what is that? So I had to go to the parents, right? Mhm. Mm that's the first place I got to stop before I get back to the kids, right? Mm -hmm. I got to go to the parents. And then now I'm going back into other man, right? I see your parents, your parents dressing like they're in a video like you. What are they teaching you? What are your, va what are your core values? Right. Right. What's important to you? What do you want to be? I ask kids all the time to get stumped. What do you want to be when you grow up? I don't want to hear this made up stuff. I want to be a lawyer. I want to be a businessman. That means what do you want to be? You don't want a job? I mean, not to say it like that, but to me is, what are you going to do to get there, right? What are right. you doing now to push you forward to and those, get there? Those are the kind of conversations I have with kids. Like, all right, what is it that you want to be? And they could tell me. I don't. They could tell me they want to be an astronaut. Mm -hmm. That's fine. What are you doing right now currently that's going to help you to get to that point? Mm -hmm. um, are you studying certain things? Are you making sure that your grades are on point? So if you have to go to college for that position, are you going to be able to get into the one that you want to get into mm -hmm. that has the best program for what it is that you want to get into? Well, I come back to you as a kid, well, man, I don't know what you're talking about. My mom ain't, ain't worried about that. My mom told me she know a million people that got college degrees that 
they live next door to us and they ain't doing nothing. He down the street selling, selling and hustling. And so that don't mean nothing to me. I need money today. I can't eat. You know, I'm trying to live right now. I'm trying to get that bag. And what you gonna tell me about that? How you gonna help me get that bag? And <laughs> as a community, that's when we come together to help as well. Um, you know, if a kid, you know, sees it as, well, they hustling to make ends meet, that's what I'm gonna do. Teach them another hustle. Teach them a, a legal hustle. Right. But how do we, but I, I, I use that example that I just gave you as, again, going back to the devaluing of education in our community. How do we put the valuation there, right? Mm -hmm. Because typically I hear people, most people say, oh, education don't mean anything. I usually go, well, you must not have a degree. You must, you know, because you typically hear that from someone who, who, doesn't have one. who doesn't have one. So, and it doesn't mean that you're better than anyone because you have one, but we got to go back to educating people on different keys, right. trades, different options, different roads to be successful, different roads to be entrepreneurs, right? Right. To be, to be your own man, right? Yeah. Because we had that in our other communities, right? Right. We were our own men. We made our, in the midst of segregation, we had our own communities, we had our own stores, we had our own banks, we created all these different things and not pushing the segregation thing. I'm just pushing what we lost. Right. Because what we thought what was what was across the street was better than what we had. So we ran so hard away from from what we had. Going look at the historical black colleges that we had, you know, responsible for educating Supreme Court judges, lawyers, some of the most intellectual African Americans in history came out of there. People died uh, for this, for these schools to be created. You know, we ran from those schools to some of those to, to some of those other institutions. And I'm gonna let you talk about the HBCUs real quickly, but just to add, and then going back to the, the young kids that you're engaging in schools, they don't, see, when I hear that, I get upset because they don't understand people died so they can go to school. And that's that historical standpoint of them, that pride um, about learning about their past and that we have so many influential people that help build this country that they are not getting, that they're not being taught. But like you said, you know, sometimes you, you, you're insane if you think that a system that wasn't set up for you to succeed is you're banking on them to teach everything that they need. Yeah, I agree, I agree totally. Um, now, what I want to do, since we've kind of, we've talked about, you know, the parents a little bit, the kids a little bit, we talked about the schools, now I want to go right into Fuel the Crutch. Tell me, uh, through your interactive workshop, how you take those situations, those circumstances, and help kids make the right choices and navigate those situ those landmines to push them forward in a positive way. So like one of the examples I give is, uh, you know, taking some of those negative uh, perceived events in your life mm -hmm. and turning them into something positive that can help push you and motivate you. Uh, one that I use is, um, as a kid, uh, my god brother died. Mm -hmm. um, I was four, he was five. Um, I just realized within the last year or so how much that really affected me. I um, mean, it affected me like to a point where, you know, this happened when I was four. I can still remember crying uh, in the fourth grade, you know, because of the effect it had on me. And then even as I got older, I started to think like, man, would I have chosen to go to a different high school had he been alive? Because he's a year older than me. You know, if we're that close, you know, him going to a certain school, I might have wanted to go there with him. Mm -hmm. uh, would we have pushed each other harder in academics? Would we have pushed each other harder in, in sports? Would he have decided to go to a certain college and it would have changed my thought process on going to wherever I went because that's where he was because he's a year older, so he would have went there first. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I had to stop making so many excuses, you know, for why I wasn't doing anything. I'm like, oh, man, if he was here, then this would have happened. Mm -hmm. Or, um, you know getting into fights when I was a kid, uh, you know, using that anger that this, oh, this happened. I'm, I got all this anger bottled up inside of me because, you know, this situation happened. And eventually I got to a point where I was, I had to stop and look at myself in the mirror. And I was like, man, you know, you gotta, you gotta, you know, stop making these excuses for yourself. Like, you've got this, this kid. I mean, you know, you, you got this situation. Mm -hmm. um, and right now you're using it as a crutch and as an excuse. So what I had to do was I decided to, to look at it from a different lens. I was like, well, what if I, 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 I set him up as he was my guardian angel. He was somebody that was looking out for me from heaven, smiling down on me. Mm -hmm. And I needed to make him proud. I wanted to make him proud. 
versus him frowning and, and being upset or disappointed in what I was doing. So turning that negative situation into something positive for me to push me. Mm -hmm. I mean, the situation happened where he passed and there was nothing I could do about it, even to, you know, to this day. Mm -hmm. But I can change my, my thought process behind it as it being something to make him proud, you know, to, to make me, to push me in a positive direction, yeah. to work harder, to make sure that he's proud, that he's not frowning down on me, he's smiling. So that's the premise behind Fuel of Crutch, taking your circumstance, your negative circumstance, and using it as, as fuel to push you forward to push and not and allowing it to turn into a crutch. Right. You want it to, to serve as a push and motivation versus serving as a hindrance and holding you back. Well, Jamal, and I want to really thank you for uh, taking the time to come on um, the conversation shop today and just share with us who you are your perspective and share with us your wonderful interactive aspects of your wonderful interactive uh, workshop fuel a crutch why don't you uh, leave my audience real quick with uh, some information on how to get in touch with you if they're interested in uh, having you come out and talk about your workshop yes um, I've got a website that I just launched eubanksolutions.com it kind of has my workshop um, on there laid out in three different phases you can get me to come out to speak to different schools, different programs, professional development. Um, and there's a, at the bottom of it, you can uh, contact me and I have an email for you to send to me and I can work something out um, and come out and speak to as many kids as possible and or people in general. Um, I also want to make sure that people are aware of the merchandise that we do have as well. We've got wristbands, we've got um, shirts, the wristband here, says fuel a crutch on one side, but then on the back it says your choice because at the end of the day it's going to be on you how you internalize those situations. And then uh, lastly, it was just fuel a crutch is like the shirt uh, with the hashtag on it. Um, and, you know, we, this Black History Month uh, exclusive was just to so talk about how we support our HBCUs because HBCUs were uh, trailblazers for education for us because at some at one point, us as African Americans, we weren't allowed to be educated in our predominantly white institutions. So we, um, you know, use this as trailblazers. They use it as fuel instead of a crutch. They made things happen. I love that. Well, thanks again. And I'd like to thank you all for joining us on The Conversation Shop. See you next week.